sort of how does that affect both human and animal populations in the past? And I think you'll see there's a <coughs> fundamental basic uh, thing here going on between uh, populations in the past and water resources. And when you look at somewhere like Arabia today, I mean, it's quite amazing, actually. It's very impressive in the sense of the large amount of growth and development that you see. I mean, these cities are just growing um, at, at an exponential rate. Uh, and it's almost really impressive. It's almost sort of like niche construction, right? So you have all these, these, these booming populations uh, living in places like Riyadh, which is really expanding. And it's, uh, it, that, those populations obviously couldn't live in this sort of arid and hyper-arid uh, conditions without sort of major efforts um, in terms of turning salt water into fresh water, for example, like desalinization plants, um, and you know, sort of uh, undertaking major projects like tapping into groundwater and, um, and feeding the desert so that farming can be done. Obviously, uh, this is uh, done. Um, this is done, but those environments are very sensitive. These are very sort of hostile environments, and um, playing around with the water um, can be very precarious. And in fact, the UN uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change also warns for somewhere like uh, Arabia that in the next 50 years, uh, Arabia will likely experience anywhere between a two to eight degree increase, uh, Celsius increase in, in um, temperature. So it's quite a dramatic change that may happen uh, in the next 50 years. And so this is something that obviously populations living in those areas need to be really um, careful about. Now, also, what is predicted is that there's also going to be an increase in rainfall. And you think, okay, well, there's an increase in temperature, but there's also an increase in rainfall. And, and in some ways, that increase in rainfall is, is, is a good thing, except that in desert environments, when you get a lot of rain all at once, especially with, with uh, you know, hyper-arid deserts, it runs off very rapidly. And so some of the flash floods that you see today, in fact, uh, will increase. The prediction is flash flooding will increase <coughs> in the future. So this is quite a, um, an interesting story in terms of um, you know, the ability to, to live in such uh, conditions, but also it also in a sense a warning uh, in terms of the future. And what I would like to do is try to explore the past and see if there's any insights that we can make uh, about the relationship between climate change, environments, and what is going on in terms of prehistory. Um, when you look at things like marine cores and, and ice cores, obviously over the last few million years, um, there have been major fluctuations between cooling and warming of, of Earth, right? And that is, in the north, led to glaciations, expansions of glaciers, and receding of glaciers. But in southern latitudes, what happens is there's either a drying of those landscapes or a wetting. So you get alternating wetting and drying through time <coughs> in southern zones. And so places like the Sahara, obviously, and Arabia today are arid and hyper-arid uh, deserts based on rainfall. But uh, in the past, it was green, and it was wet, and it was green and wet many times in the past. So there were major fluctuations <coughs> through time between arid and humid conditions. And in fact, we have started, as part of the Paleo Deserts Project, started to work with a number of groups which actually simulate climate change in the future. But we're also trying to simulate the conditions in the past as well. So we're actually working on 1,000-year time slices in the past with these climate scientists in order to predict not only the future, but the past. And what can computer simulations tell us about conditions? And this is just um, an example of current annual rainfall 
which is very clear about these desert zones. And this is the, what's called the last interglacial, or about 125,000 years ago. So this is a computer simulation which predicts uh, the past. And you can see, based on these computer simulations, that rainfall, the monsoon, changed through time. And monsoons delivered a lot more rainfall across Arabia 125,000 years ago. And so the main question we have from these models is what, what happened on the ground? Can we say something more about those environments? Can we say what effect that had on early humans and human populations? So again, we're working on many computer models and we're working over through, through time. So one of the other projects uh, related to these computer simulations is uh, mapping the watershed. So we're using uh, shuttle radar topography of mission data, um, and we're mapping all of the rivers of Arabia. And so um, King's College uh, London is very much involved in this work. And what you can see, what's so dramatic, is that there are many rivers all across Arabia, and most of these are obviously extinct. Uh, and these are just the main ones. Uh, the folks that are working on this remote sensing data tell me that if you actually put all the rivers of Arabia onto a map, it would just look like one big river. <laughs> There's that many rivers. Which I think, you know, when they first started to develop this, I was quite taken aback by it because, you know, there are an awful lot of rivers and we can actually map those things using uh, remote sensing uh, data. So that's the beginning point of our project. And, uh, and, and when we started to look at what was known with respect to those early surveys uh, and trying to look at those rivers, we immediately realized that there were in fact relationships between those archeological sites that those surveys had you know, um, um, produced and some of those rivers themselves. So we can see a correspondence between the two. We also um, undertook new surveys of some of those uh, uh, rivers, and lo and behold, we find archaeological sites, in this case very early uh, archaeological sites, very in very close um, <coughs> approximation with those rivers. And in fact, what we can see is that Early humans, in this case those that were making things like hand axes, were penetrating the heart of Arabia by simply following the rivers. So imagine, you know, there's these early humans right in the center of Arabia, and the question is how they get there? They walked up the rivers. Rivers that are, don't exist, of course, anymore. So that was that was very enlightening. Um, but uh, the remote sensing data also I think shows something quite dramatic also. And that is that Arabia was not only full of rivers, but it was full of lakes. And the current count of lakes, believe it or not, is 10,000 lakes in Arabia. 10,000. Uh, we've only worked on a couple. And I'll show you the results of the couple, but there are 10,000 lakes <coughs> that are And this is just an example of, of one lake, and this is in Juba. And that lake is 20 kilometers in length. Obviously, there's no lake there now, but it was a 20 kilometer lake. What we did from the remote sensing data is we tried to look at the edges of this thing and map it in. We also looked at the Nafud Desert, and there are many lakes in the, in the Nafud Desert, sort of a hyper arid you know, place characterized by massive dunes, but there were many, many lakes in the past. And all of the blue you can see, if that population's traveled up the rivers, well, they also connect with the lakes. And so you can imagine situations where populations shift from one river and hop along the landscapes that way. So this is wonderful information, new information, and we wanted to verify whether or not this was accurate from the maps on the ground and what it could possibly tell us. And this is, a, I took a picture of us going around the Great Food Desert on November 17th, not long ago. Uh, and this is what they look like. 
So these are the massive dunes of the Nafud Desert that you always see and hear about. But here is a gigantic lake which goes under the dune. So the dunes are obviously an arid period and they're advancing, but this is obviously a humid period. And here are very thick deposits of lake marls. So we know that it was a very humid period. So here we are going for the very first time to this one particular lake. And that's what they look like. Repeatedly, we are seeing the same thing over and over and over again. And when we find, we find these very thick lake sediments, but we also find archaeology. On some of these lakes, we literally have hundreds of archaeological sites. So in Juba, we have several hundred sites now. We've mapped along that 20 uh, kilometer lake. And we surveyed some of the lakes for a couple days, and I would say about 90%, first of all, the, the satellite imagery is showing about 90% accuracy of predicting where these lakes are, so that's good. Um, and then almost, I'd say about 80 to 90% of the lakes when we visit them have archaeology on them, which I think is amazing. Uh, so that's brand new information that's been emerging. And if you can imagine there are 10,000 lakes, there's an awful lot of archaeology yet to discover out there. Um, so the relationship between, between early humans and humans and these lakes, I think, is very intimate. Okay, so, so when you get these lakes forming, obviously you're getting expansions of populations that are living along these, these places. And the big question is, what happens when it dries up? I don't know. Um, but that's something we obviously want to know. Um, when we were finding these lakes, one of the very first questions I had from um, others was, well, they may be lakes, but they may be saline. They may be very salty. And in fact, they probably don't have archaeology. We've proved that to be wrong. And so that. So, so that sort of um, forced us to try to say, are they salty lakes or are they potable lakes? So they, is the water drinkable? And some of the studies we've been undertaking, for example, on ostracods and mollusks like, uh, and snails, and we've been actually going out there and trying to see um, the kind of conditions that these lakes had. And some of them are saline, semi -saline. Uh, salty, uh, but some of them are really potable. You can really drink that water, and these creatures prove it. And most amazingly, when we look at the botany of some of these lakes, we even see that there were palms even growing around them. So we have some wooded landscapes, palms, as well as freshwater uh, species living along these lakes. So, so people, when they were following the rivers and lakes, could drink the water. So could animals, obviously. So, so this is sort of a, a, a new understanding of the situation. And we can see that water is, is extremely important when we're trying to tell the story about movements or dispersal processes and could humans live and cope in these environments. And I think that the abundance of the archaeology right now is indicating that there were definitely expansions, and early humans and humans were living in these places for quite a long period of time. 